Hey everyone, just want to welcome you to session 15. This is the final class of the end times. I know if you've been sticking with us, you're like, when is this ever going to end? And anyway, I just wanted to give you an idea of what the end times are like. Anyway, so this is session 15, the kingdom of God. And I'm excited about this session because this is incredibly good news. And I know we've looked at the negative side of things, and we've looked at the negative side of what the enemy's doing and his plans and his purposes and things like that. And, and though important, it is important because, I mean, if you're a football team and you want to figure out what the enemy's doing, your opponent is doing, you're going to spend hours and hours in the tape room. Otherwise, if you're not watching videos and you're not breaking down what they do, when, it, when, when you get into that game time situation on Saturday, you're not going to do very well. So you've got to be familiar with what, not only what God's doing, but what the enemy's doing. But I, here's the good news is the kingdom of God is coming. Now, we know the kingdom of God is here in part because we have the Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of God is, there is the, the, the kingdom of God in a measure. But I'm talking about the, the fullness of the kingdom of God is breaking into the nations and at Jesus' return. And so I want to start this session reading here from Daniel chapter 2. We spent so much time in the book of Daniel I think it would be really beneficial to end this session by talking about uh, the, this Daniel chapter 2 is Daniel's talking and he's talking to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, King, when you had the dream, here's what you saw. You continued looking until a stone was cut without hands. I love it. He's talking about the rock, which is Jesus Christ. Daniel didn't even probably know it at the time exactly all he was seeing, but we know Jesus called himself the rock. He is the, he is the stumbling stone. He is the rock of offense. He told the Jews, he said in, in Matthew chapter 20, he says, you either fall on this rock and are broken to pieces or the rock is going to fall on you and it will scatter you like dust. I can guarantee you Jesus was talking about Daniel chapter 2, verse 34. He kept looking until a stone was cut without hands. And this stone came and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and it crushed them at the same time. And so then, verse 35, the, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold, they were crushed all at the same time and became like chaff at the summer threshing floor. But the wind carried them away and not a trace of them was found. Here's what I love. But that stone you saw that came and crushed the feet, the, the toes on that statue, that stone that crushed those toes, it became a great mountain and it filled the entire earth. In other words, what Daniel's saying is the king of kings and lord of lords is that rock. And when he strikes the Antichrist and that eighth kingdom and demolishes and obliterates them and absolutely crushes them at that time, the kingdom of God is then going to fill the entire earth. And that's what we're talking about in this session. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. We are living in a time where we are transitioning into the kingdom age. And I, I've heard some who believe in this uh, dominionism and post-millennialism say we're moving into the kingdom age, but they, their idea is that we're moving into the kingdom age without the king. And I think that's frankly impossible. <laughs> We've got the spirit of the king, but I'm telling you what we're talking about here is the kingdom age. There is no such thing as the kingdom age without the king himself being uh, feet planted on this earth for a second time. Zechariah and Zechariah 14 said, then the king, he will be king over all of the earth. How incredible is that? What an incredible promise. Jesus Christ will be king of the entire earth and his name will be the only one. We're moving into that time known as the kingdom age. Incredible, incredible, incredible. So here we want to talk about the millennial kingdom. The kingdom age, the millennial kingdom. As we want to talk about the millennial kingdom because Jesus is coming back. He's going to strike that statue and he's going to set up what some have called the messianic kingdom, the kingdom age, the millennial kingdom. 
We're talking about here Revelation chapter 20 is when the word a thousand is mentioned, uh, I think, five or six different times. And so what exactly does that mean? Well, there's been several different views, uh, and I think there's really two primary views that make the most sense. There's the premillennial view, which is the view that I teach, the view that I believe in. And the idea of the premillennial view is that, we go, that, that Jesus ascended, we currently live in the church age, and that um, there is still another, there is still seven years of Daniel's 70th week. And when that, when that, when those seven year period is, on, uh, is fulfilled, then Jesus is going to return at which time he sets up the millennial kingdom, which is, you know, I, I think it's a thousand years, but if someone says, well, how do you know it's a thousand years? You know, it's some kind of uh, finite period of time before the eternal ages begins. And so um, that's the premillennial view. And so the other view that's held by amillennial or the postmillennial view sees, and I've got, if you look at the notes, I've got charts in here to help you understand that a, lot, a little bit better. But the idea of this, the, pre, the uh, amillennial or the postmillennial, and we looked at that, I think, in session two, amillennial and postmillennial, they believe that the millennial kingdom is actually taking place right now through the church and that Christ is ruling and reigning over the earth through the church. Amillennial or postmillennial is very optimistic. If you don't remember the different, different distinctions between them, postmillennial is very optimistic that says, okay, well, there, there's not only going to, not only is the church ruling on the earth, but the but there's going to be this great massive revival that's going to Christianize all of the nations and it's going to transform all of the nations and it's going to bring all the nations to Christianity. The amillennial view is a lot less pessimistic. It says that Christ is ruling through the church through the gospel, but not, not taking dominion over cultures and transforming nations. So those are the two real views. And so I want to just talk briefly here about why I believe the premillennial view is what is actually being taught in Revelation chapter 20, verse uh, 2 through 7. And I think it's, it's mentioned, I think, six different times here. But um, I want to just summarize here why I believe the, the premillennial view is correct. I'm going to give you five reasons um, why, the, why there's coming, why the, this kingdom is going to be I think it's a thousand years, but it's a, a long period of time, but a finite period of time before the eternal ages commence. The first one, the first reason, it's the most literal way to read the text. And, and let me just actually start by reading Revelation 20 for us, not the whole chapter. But let me read Revelation, just some of the, the key, the key um, phrases here. Starting in uh, Revelation 20, verse 1, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. And he bound him for a thousand years. Notice that. He bound him for a thousand years. So if you're, if you're premillennial, you believe that thousand years is going to be most likely a literal thousand years or a long period of time. If you're amillennial or postmillennial, you're going to say, well, that's just a symbolic thing that's happening right now as in the church age. Now, verse 3, he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Verse 4, then I saw thrones and they sat on them and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Again, a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life and the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection over these, the second death has no power, but these will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So let me talk about now why I believe the premillennial view is the correct view. Number one, 
It's just the most literal way to read the text. You read it, it says a thousand years, and it just makes the most sense. Um, otherwise, you've got to come up with a, an explanation to say, okay, well, why, what's happened? I thought Satan was banned. Are you saying Satan is no longer even working in operation in, in the nations? And so it's just the most literal way to read the text. We know from one of our earlier sessions that when you come to the subject of end time prophecy is the default method of interpreting the prophetic scriptures is to take it literal because in Isaiah and many of the prophets, the prophecies of Jesus' first coming, they were made literally and they were fulfilled literally. And so therefore, unless the context suggests otherwise, our default method for interpreting the prophetic scripture should always be literal. Now, of course, if something in the context shows us this is more of a symbol, like we saw with the seven beasts in Daniel, like we saw with the different elements of the statue in Daniel, then, of course, we seek in for a greater interpretation. But when you read uh, Revelation chapter 20, to me, it's the most literal way to believe that this thousand-year period is a thousand-year period when Jesus Christ rules on the earth with his church. Page four here in the notes is the second reason I believe this is describing a literal thousand year period is that Satan is literally bound from deceiving the nations in any type of way for 1,000 years. I mean, when you read the beginning of Revelation chapter 20 and you see an angel comes and he takes a key to the abyss, opens it up, puts Satan the dragon into that abyss, closes it up, locks it up. He's in prison for a thousand years so that he can't deceive the nations for any longer. To me, it's really clear what the text is saying. You don't have to have some kind of like crazy allegorical interpretation of what that means. That means that literally the sa Satan will be put into the abyss, imprisoned for a thousand years so he cannot deceive the nations. Well... If you're an amillennialist or you're a, pre or a post millennialist, and you come to this text and you say, well, the, the, Jesus is ruling and reigning through the church right now, through his church, then you've got a real problem when it comes to this particular text. Some have tried to get around that, and I'll talk about that in a second, but you look at, and I've got it listed here in the notes, as you see clearly in Revelation 12, 9, Revelation 13, 14, Revelation 18, 23, Revelation 19, 20. You see very clearly that Satan is deceiving the nations up until the time of the Antichrist and especially deceives the nations through the Antichrist, that he is, he is presently deceiving the nations and will deceive the nations through the Antichrist. You also see 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, that Paul described that the coming of the Antichrist, his coming is with the activity of Satan, with all signs and wonders and false miracles. Well, if Satan's bound, how in the world could that ever be possible? If Satan is in is in prison, how in the world could, or, you know, yeah, how in the world could that actually take place? And so, you know, the only way that you can come to an explanation of that is to embrace, like we've said, that partial preterism view that prophecy was fulfilled, or most prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD. Well, some try to get around that issue. Some try to, some amillennialists say, well, it's, it's the binding of Satan is only a binding that's preventing him from launching Armageddon prematurely. But I, I still, when I look at that, I'm like, the, first of all, the text does not say that. To me, when I look at that text, it looks like, okay, this binding, he is thrown into the abyss. He's thrown into prison. And there is no, I mean, he's, he is chained up, unable to do anything. And so I think when you look at it, Number two, Satan literally bound from deceiving the nations in any way for a thousand years. You realize, okay, uh, you realize this, that to me it's got to be describing the millennial kingdom. The 1,000 year reign is a, is a literal, finite, but uh, long period of time before the eternal ages. The, the, the third thing here is premillennialism is the only interpretation that accounts for the literal resurrection of the dead. When you read it, Revelation chapter 20, 
It talks about the, the first resurrection, and it says, you know, I saw thrones, they sat on them, judgment was given to them. I saw those who had been beheaded because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. I saw those who had not received the mark or the image of his name. In other words, John is, is showing us the martyrs and the overcomers, and he says these are the ones who were resurrected. So if you are a amillennialist or a postmillennialist, you would look at that and you would interpret it symbolically, what many do, as a symbolic reference to the resurrection that took place when you were saved. Well, okay, if you say that, then you, then you make a lot. I mean, you make so much out of that verse, make no sense. What about the beheading? Does that have not have no, how do you, how do you interpret that? When you're, they were beheaded or they received thrones or they resisted the mark of the beast. I mean, how do you come to grips with that if you just spiritualize it? And so to me, the, the clear, clear uh, solution. The, the only thing that makes sense is the premillennial view that interprets that literally and says, no, that the, the first resurrection from the dead with uh, when, when God's people are given glorified bodies, that takes place prior to this 1,000 year reign. Number four, if Jesus Christ is presently ruling over the earth, as amillennialists and postmillennialists say, if Jesus Christ is presently ruling over the earth, he's not doing a very good job. I can say it that way, meaning no respect, disrespect to the Lord, because he's not presently ruling over the earth through his church. He's just not. He will. He will rule the earth with his church, but he's not doing it right now. I mean, just look at the, I mean, I'm not saying there's not pockets where the kingdom of God is advancing. And I'm not saying there's not pockets where the kingdom of God's salt and light are penetrating into culture. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely there are. I mean, the, the nation of America has, has had a tr profound impact by Judeo-Christianity. So obviously the kingdom of God has advanced uh, in, in some measure, but Jesus is not ruling over the entire earth right now through his church. And you look at it, you go, okay, well, just look at what's going on. I mean, we've gone mad. We've gone crazy. We don't even know what bathroom to use anymore. And you look at the whole, the pornography and the rebellion and the lawlessness and the greed and the pedophilia and the witchcraft and the occultic practices and all the rise of new age and all these things. You're like, you really think Jesus is ruling over the nations right now? I mean, come on, come on, really? You really think, I mean, what hope would we have? <laughs> and you can look at 2,000 years of church history. What hope do we have if Jesus is going to rule the nations through his mostly backslidden, carnal, lukewarm, worldly, immature, selfish church? What hope do we have? I and mean, we don't have, I, that gives, gives me no hope whatsoever. If Jesus is presently ruling over this earth, I have no hope until the new heavens and the new earth come and this planet is destroyed by fire. But praise God, that's not what, that's not what Revelation is teaching us. Let me show you why I, I, I believe that. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, it says, They came to life and they, rule, they, they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. And I want to stress the word, they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The text does not say Christ reigns through his church. It says they reigned with Christ. That's a massive difference. That's a big, big distinction because if Christ is reigning through us, he's dependent on us. If we fail, he, his rule fails. What this is saying is something completely different. Christ is reigning as king, and his church is reigning with him. We are his partners. He's not dependent on us. We're dependent on him. And so I just want to say emphatically that Jesus Christ is not reigning over this earth right now, but he is going to reign over this earth. That's the good news, that we are coming into a time when the scriptures say you have taken your great power 
and you have begun to reign. And when Jesus begins to reign, the nations who love darkness will be enraged at him and they will hate him because his kingdom is coming and his kingdom is coming in fullness. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken as the literal, physical fullness of the kingdom of God comes to this earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. That is the good news. This, I'm telling you, Jesus is not presently ruling over the earth. The other thing, number five, is premillennialism is the only interpretation where Old Testament prophecies to Israel are literally fulfilled. Amillennialism and postmillennialism, I don't care how much they love Israel, are rooted in replacement theology. Because Jesus did not come to cancel the promises to Israel. He came to confirm the promises to Israel. That's what Romans teaches. Jesus didn't come to cancel. He came to confirm. There are, and we've already looked at so many, but there are so many, I mean, I don't know the number, but there are multitudes of prophetic promises scattered in the Old Testament prophets talking about the restoration of Israel and all these incredible promises that if the amillennial or postmillennial views were correct would mean God has canceled those promises. It means that God has replaced them with the church, and that's not what Scripture teaches. Here's just a few promises. Here's a few promises that, that the prophets talk about, and, and we're talking about the messianic millennial kingdom, that there is coming a time when Jerusalem will be the capital city of the kingdom of God. Israel will be the worship center of the entire planet. That the nations that don't go to worship the King of kings and Lord of lords in Jerusalem will find themselves living in a drought. Israel will be the place from where God's glory shines forth into the nations. Jerusalem will be the epicenter for, of the glory of God that will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. From Zion, from Jerusalem, the Lord will showcase his beauty and glory. Israel will be the place from which divine blessings, favor, prosperity, peace are released into the nations. And finally, Israel will be the place of unspeakable joy and gladness. If you've ever read the prophets, you just come away going, oh my goodness, God's prophetic destiny for the nation of Israel and the Jewish people is truly profound, truly profound. And when Jesus Christ, the greater son of David, when he comes back, and he sits on the throne of David, he is going to fulfill every single one of those prophetic promises that we look at today and go, how is that going to be fulfilled? He is the greater son of David. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the root and the offspring of David. He's coming back, and he's coming to Jerusalem to set up the kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, the messianic kingdom that the prophets talked about. Amen. Sorry, that's not the clue to end. I, I just said amen to that section. My video guy, I could tell he was moving towards pushing stop, but unfortunately, I've got a lot more to go. So anyway, um, continuing on, I just want to just talk about just for a minute, what, just to give you a picture, I just want to give you a picture, okay, what, how incredible will this time be? I mean, what is it going to look like when, I mean, just get the picture. You get, you, we've talked about the seventh and the eighth kingdom. The seventh kingdom comes down. The Antichrist and ten kings destroy Rome, and they set up the eighth kingdom, and it's an Islamic caliphate in the Middle East, and Jerusalem has been besieged for three and a half years, and Jesus Christ comes, and he comes back, and he defeats the enemies, crushes them. He then establishes the kingdom of God in Jerusalem. How I mean, how incredible is that going to be? What is that going to look like? What is it going to be like to live in that time as the kingdom age is coming upon us? And so Jesus would be the king of the entire earth. There will be no other names. That's beautiful. There will be no other names. There will no be the names of athletes and entertainers and presidents and wealthy businessmen and famous preachers and 
apostles and prophets, there's not going to be another name but his name and his name alone. It's going to be absolutely incredible. The millennial kingdom will be an unprecedented time of peace, prosperity, righteousness, and glory. Heaven is going to invade earth. And I'm talking about heaven is invading earth in fullness. All of God's enemies will be defeated. Satan will be bound for a thousand years. I, I was alluding to this earlier, but Zechariah said, in that day, his name will be the only one. See, when Jesus Christ comes back enthroned as King of kings and Lord of lords, the kingdom of God is coming to the earth in fullness and it's going to transform this, this world into a lush paradise like the Garden of Eden. And it talks about in Isaiah that the glory of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Revelation 26 20 verse 6 says, Christ will reign for a thousand years. And we talked about why I believe it's a thousand years. But what's going to happen is, what's going to happen is the kingdom of God is literally going to penetrate into every facet of culture, what people have called the seven mountains of culture, government, media, arts and entertainment, finances, religion, family, whatever. You know, I don't believe they're going to be Christianized before he comes back. But when he comes back, let me tell you, Every facet of every sphere of culture will be penetrated by the kingdom of God so that the entire world will be completely under the domain of the kingdom of God. It will be from every single nation will come under his dominion and the kingdom of God will be established. Scripture talks about it being like the Garden of Eden. Um, there will be worldwide justice. You know, we look at so many injustices in our nation, in our world, and we go, when is justice coming? Justice is coming when the judge of the earth comes back, and I'm telling you, he will bring justice to every wrong. He will right every wrong. He will bring justice to everyone who is oppressed. He will, do, he will upturn and up, bring upheaval to all the dark and demonic and selfish, rebellious, lawless governments of man. He's coming to bring worldwide justice, worldwide peace. Healing will be, it, I mean, it, you know, it talks about in, in uh, Isaiah that if someone dies at 100, they'll be like a youth and people will think they're cursed. Um, the longevity of life is going to increase substantially. Jesus, the tree of life, when he rules from Jerusalem, he's going to bring the lifespan of humans who survived the great tribulation, their longevity is going to go, I mean, who knows how long, they're probably more like to the times of the flood, you know? They lived 300, 400, 500, 600 years, 800 years, whatever. Jesus, the tree of life, is going to increase their longevity of life. There will be great joy, great peace. War will be a thing of the past. Prosperity uh, will flow. And, and so the utopia that mankind has been dreaming about and trying to build all the way back to Babel, that for like 6,000 years mankind is trying to build, build this utopia, this utopia will finally come because the King of kings and Lord of lords will be ruling and reigning from Jerusalem. And he will make, he will, he will be the one who brings in final utopia into the planet. And at that time, he will make he is going to make Jerusalem the capital city of the kingdom of God and out from Jerusalem into every Gentile nation the kingdom of God will flow out. It is an incredibly glorious time. Just an incredible, I love even talking about it. Uh, the city of the great king is Jerusalem. And Jeremiah said at that time they're going to say Jerusalem is the throne of the Lord. His throne will be in Jerusalem. And that throne being in Jerusalem means that God's returning to Zion. And out of that place in Zion and in Jerusalem, the epicenter of the glory of God, it will radiate into every single nation of the earth. And Jesus Christ will reign as king. And, and it talks about then Jerusalem will be the praise of the entire earth. We'll see Rome raised up as the praise of the entire earth before Jesus comes back. But I'm telling you, it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the praise of the earth when Jesus Christ comes back and reigns as king. At that time, every leader 
of every nation, judges, statesmen, kings, politicians, presidents, businessmen, all of them will, will, all of them, I believe, will get saved. They'll come to Jerusalem. They'll base their entire, whatever, whether it's business, government, uh, whatever, whatever they're doing, they'll base it entirely on God's word, on God's kingdom principles. And so, you know, it says that they're going to flock Isaiah chapter 2, the, the, the mount, the nations are streaming to Jerusalem to get counsel from the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the word of the Lord will go forth from Jerusalem and the, the, the law of God will go forth from Jerusalem. And so, anyway, I could just spend so much, so much time talking about this. And those go into more detail. But when you think about this is the kings of the earth, the leadership in all of the nations who, you know, some people think, well, it's going to be this, they see everything so black and white. But I think scripture talks about there will be resistors. And the resistors will, res they won't be born again. They won't be uh, born again during the last three and a half years. But they will not bow to the Antichrist. They'll see what it is and say, well, we're not touching that. We don't believe in that. We don't believe he's God. They're going to resist. And so those who survived the Great Tribulation, the leadership out of the Great Tribulation, when, you know, so many of them are going to get saved and they're going to base their national governments and their infrastructures and all that they do, they're going to base it on the Word of God so that the Kingdom of God penetrates into every facet of, so of uh, society and every facet of culture. And here's what I love. If you're, if you're a born-again Christian and you love the Lord, and you, you wholeheartedly pursue the Lord, and you live for the Lord, then you're going to come back with him, ruling and reigning with him. You're going to be given a throne. If you ever come lukewarmness, you'll be given a throne. If you ever come Jezebel, you'll be given a rod of iron, and you will rule and reign with Christ together with the kings of the earth, with non-resurrected bodies, you with a resurrected body. You will literally take the kingdom of God into real cities, into real nations, and you will establish the kingdom of God in those cities and in those nations. It's an incredible time, just incredible when the entire world is brought under the dominion of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, um, if you've had our eternal purpose class or if you've read the book, The Eternal Blueprint, it goes into detail about this. But Paul talks about the administration suitable to the fullness of times that God, Christ being the ultimate intention of God, Christ being the eternal purpose of God, that at the fullness of times, God is going to sum up all things in Christ, things in heaven, things on the earth. And so what we see in the millennial kingdom is this summing up of the things on the earth and the summing up of the things in the heavens. The things on the earth talk about the natural processes of life. See, when Jesus comes back, people think it's going to be this completely supernatural thing, but it, there's also going to be this, the natural processes of life continue. People will continue to give birth. People will continue People will die, though the longevity of life will be extended. People will work. People will build, plant, vineyards. It'll, I mean, they're going to travel here and there. I mean, I'm, I would imagine it's going to be just like as we have it now. The natural processes of life continue as they are today. But heaven speaks of that supernatural dimension, like the glory of God coming, the fullness of the outpouring of the Spirit. I mean, what we saw at Pentecost won't even compare to what's coming when the powers of the age to come are actually the powers of that age. And so the, those, those glorious promises, the glorious power of God comes. And, you know, I, don't, I believe that people who get sick will be healed in an instant. There will be miracles flowing, glory increase. I mean, it'll just be unlike anything we could ever imagine. The glory of God will be shining forth. So this... The summing up of all things into Christ, things in heaven, things in earth, is bringing, out, bringing together the glory of God, the supernatural dimension of God, bringing it together with the natural processes of life to bring everything together summed up in his beloved son, Jesus Christ. So the, the natural processes of life 
are going to continue. The natural processes of life will continue as we know them. We're going to see people. They're going to rebuild cities. They're going to rebuild the desolate cities. Uh, Isaiah spoke about the desolate cities, the cities devastated during the Great Tribulation, devastated because of the world war that took place, devastated because of the earthquakes and the shaking and all that took place. God's going to then send forth his his people, and they're going to rebuild. They're going to, uh, re, they're going to have building projects and all the places torn down. And so we're talking about just an incredible time of rebuilding, and all the infrastructure will, will be rebuilt. And so anyway, I've got more details there in the notes. But the other thing is, you know, sometimes, sometimes people have this idea that when Jesus comes back, he's just going to wave the magic wand and poof, everything is going to be restored fully in one moment. But I just don't think that's the way it's going to work. I think it's going to be this progressive, um, this progressive influence of the kingdom. The, the kingdom of God uh, is going to increase progressively. It's not just going to be this waving of the wand and all of a sudden every nation's transformed. All of a sudden everyone's saved. All of a sudden, the kingdom of God has penetrated into every mountain of culture. I think it's going to take time, and it's going to, it's going to be a process. It's going to be a process. And we know the scripture that Isaiah said that, that there will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace. On the throne of David, there it is again, the Davidic king. On the throne of David, he will sit. He will establish justice and righteousness and of the increase of his government, there will be no end. In other words, there is always, even now, there is a progressive increase of his government. As the kingdom of God is here in part, and we have the kingdom of God now, but not yet, as the theologians say, is, but when the kingdom of God is here fully, it's going to progressively take over every single nation. Now here, the big question people have a lot of times is like, hey, what do you, why do you think God is doing this whole millennial kingdom thing? I mean, why, why is God having a millennial kingdom? Why doesn't he just come back and, and fulfill the eternal ages and just get on with the show? I mean, why is he having this millennial kingdom? And I, I think it's, it's pretty simple, in fact, is God is going to use this period of time for Jesus Christ to his kingdom to penetrate into every nation, his kingdom to penetrate into every culture, to penetrate into every heart. And God is, or God's going to use this time to prepare the nations for the glory of the Father when he comes. See, God's glory, the glory of God, even during the millennial kingdom, you know, I think of it like this is, Jesus will have, um, I mean, this is the way I think about it, he'll have a dimmer, you know, a dimmer of lights. And so when you get around people in non-resurrected bodies, he'll turn the dimmer all the way down. So he's just a natural man. But then there'll come times when he'll turn the dimmer all the way up and he'll radiate the glory of God. So there'll just be this, this flowing in between the glory and the natural realm. But when the Father comes, then the glory of God will come to the earth in fullness and Jesus is being used to bring every one of his enemies under his dominion, under his reign. In fact, Paul in, in 1 Corinthians 15, 24 was talking and he says, he's writing about the millennial kingdom and he says, then comes the end. I believe that's talking about the millennial kingdom at the end of the millennial kingdom. When Jesus hands the kingdom to God the Father, when he has abolished all rule, all authority, all power, because it will take time to do this, for he must reign until he has put his enemies under his feet. I believe that's talking about the millennial kingdom, the reign of Jesus Christ on the earth, and all of his enemies become his footstool. I believe, simply put, it's going to take a thousand years. There's so much that will have to happen. It's going to take time for this the kingdom to penetrate, the kingdom to influence and to uh, move into that. So I think, it's, that's one of, I think that's the, the real purpose of the millennial kingdom is it takes a thousand years for this to happen. And the last thing I'll talk about here as it relates to this session 
is the faithful saints are going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. How incredible is that? I, I, this, is, this gives me so much hope, and I just want to offer it to you. This get, just should give you so much hope. You have, I mean, your life in this life may not be deemed successful. You may not have the influence you wanted or the fruit you wanted or all the things you dreamed about may or may not happen. But I just want to say this. If you will remain faithful to the Lord, if you will remain in that place of first love with him, if you will remain in that place of intimacy and devotion to him, if you will remain in that place of ministry to the Lord, where your first ministry is not to the people, your first ministry is not in the outer court, but to the Lord himself and the Holy of Holies, then you will, you will participate in that rule and reign with Jesus. Revelation verse 20, verse 4, chapter 20, verse 4, Paul or John says, Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image. They had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. How incredible that Jesus is going to share his kingdom rule with you and with me. That we are going to be given a rod of iron. And that rod of iron is going to be that, that ability to bring about judicial authority, kingdom authority. That rod of iron is going to crush rebellion to where those who are wanting to rebel against God's word, God's ways, God's principles, that rod of iron will crush it and bring it down. That you literally are invited to sit down with Jesus on his throne as he also overcame and sat down with his father on his throne. You are invited to, to sit down as a ruler and reigner with Jesus Christ. That is awesome. Re read the parable of the Minas. The parable of the Minas in Luke 19 you know, we often think, well, okay, that's just some symbolism here that if you, that if you uh, are faithful with your time, your money, your talents, your influence, if you're faithful with that, if you're a good steward with that, then God is going to give you authority, but it's not really literal over cities. But no, that's not true. Re read it, read it, read it. Luke chapter 19 is when he comes back, if we were faithful stewards then we will be giving authority over 10 cities, five cities. You know, it's up to him how many cities we'll have authority over, but we're going to be given authority over cities as we rule and reign with Christ. That's incredible. We're, we're, you know, we're, he's, going to, he's going to entrust the kingdom to us. And so, you know, his exhortation to us is do business until I come. Be a faithful steward until I come. Take the, what God's given you. Take the gifts God's given you. Take the talents God's given you. Take the resources and the influence and the connections God has given you. And be incredibly faithful to what he's given you. And it will increase in this life. But it will, even, it will prepare you as a steward to rule and reign in the next age. Amen. So God's preparing you. This is like an internship. You're being trained for that age. You're being trained for the millennial kingdom. You are in a 70, 80, 100 year internship that God is using to prepare you for the millennial kingdom. See, you think that, okay, this little task I'm doing or this little mundane thing I'm doing, no one sees, it's boring. It's just, you be faithful in that. You be faithful in that and you know, God, will, God sees even the cup, cup of cold water you bring in his name. That little task you're doing faithfully, that little task you're doing as you, you know, I'll just talk about our video person, Doug Meadows. He's so, mo, incredibly faithful. And what a servant. He's meeting me up here at 4 o'clock to record two sessions and has to listen to me for two hours. Yet he's faithful every single week to get this stuff out on YouTube, to get it out um, all into the internet to record all the stuff he's done, that kind of stuff. F faithful steward with what the, the, the things God given, God's given you. The only person that sees him is God sometimes. I see him, my dad sees him. But a lot of people don't see him because he's in a sound booth. But God sees him. And so, you know, just I'm telling you, 
Be faithful in the small thing. Be faithful as a servant. Be faithful in the kingdom business. Be faithful with the gifts, the talents, and the resources God has given you because it's not just for this life. You're not just being prepared and trained for this life. You're being equipped and trained to rule and reign with Jesus Christ as a faithful steward. You're called to reign with him during that thousand-year period. I can almost taste it. I'm like, man, I can't wait. I don't really want to die, but man, you know, be faithful. Be faithful where God's planted you. See, these cities that the parable of the mind is parable of the mind mentions, these are literal cities. Washington, D.C., New York City, Paris, London. These are literal cities, Sydney, that, that God is going to give his faithful saints authority to rule and reign over. I just hope he doesn't send me to someplace hot and humid, maybe someplace like Ireland. I'll take Ireland, Dublin or Dingle or something like that. I love Ireland or Swiss Alps or something, somewhere where the weather's perfect. But God's going to give you literal authority over cities. So as we bring this session and this class to a close, I mean, we have, there has been so much, so much information, so much information. I'm not going to try to go through all that we did. We would be here for another hour. But I'll just say this. We are, just to summarize what, what, we're, what, what we've learned in this class, just to summarize here, is end time prophecy was not fulfilled in 70 A.D., there's not a revival coming that's going to transform every nation before Jesus comes back. God's promises are Jerusalem-centric. God is going to do a work through two coming antichrist kingdoms, world powers in Israel and in his people and in the church. God is going to allow, I believe what I have explained in this class, is we are going to witness a coming clash between the New World Order, which is a one world government, a world one, world, one world economy, one world religion, a New World Order, global government is rising up right now, and the Antichrist will emerge onto the scene and take this New World Order, the seventh kingdom, to its greatest apex of uh, power in the nations. But three and a half years before Jesus comes back, he will destroy this seventh kingdom, he'll set up his eighth kingdom, which I believe is an Islamic caliphate. So we're going to, I believe we're going to witness this clash of kingdoms between the new world order and the Islamic caliphate that will take place. But then there's coming the greatest clash of kingdoms of all time when Jesus comes back, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he returns, and those who return with him are the called, chosen, and faithful. The heaven's armies covered in the fine linen, white and clean, following him on horses into battle. And together with Jesus Christ, he crushes the Antichrist, the ten kings, their army at the battle of Armageddon. He crushes them, and when he crushes the enemy, the eighth kingdom, and he completely crushes all the empires of man, then the kingdom of God, then the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever and ever. And you, if you're faithful, you will re reign with him. How incredible. And then, as we've talked about in this session, the kingdom of God will penetrate into every facet of culture. The entire nations will be transformed. The, the, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. God's kingdom authority will be established. And the nations will finally see a utopia. The, the nations will see prosperity and justice raining down and flowing like a river. Prosperity, peace, joy, glory. Oh, it's going to be incredible. Eden restored. The animal kingdom restored. Justice released. Israel made the praise of the nations. The glory of God radiating from Jerusalem into all the nations. You, with a resurrected body, if you, you're faithful, you'll have that same type dimmer on your body. However that will work, you can make yourself like a hum, normal human or you can raise it up to the highest level of glory. And the, the sons of the kingdom, it talks about in Matthew 13, they will shine with the glory of God. How awesome is that? That is why, that is why 
Romans 8, Paul said, all creation is groaning, all creation is longing for the revealing of the sons of God because the sons of God are going to come and restore creation to what it was meant to be. Oh, you can hear the groan. You can hear the groan of creation. You can hear the groan of creation, groaning, groaning for the sons of God to come forth, those conformed to the image of Christ, those who have the measure of Christ, filling them to fullness. Oh, the groan you can hear, the groan of creation. Where are the sons of God? Where is the blessed hope? He's coming and the sons of God are being raised up. Amen, Maranatha. We say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you so much for being a part of our end time class. Just share this with your friends and get the word out there. I'm telling you, even though things are going to be shaken, we are being prepared for an unshakable kingdom that has no end. Our king is coming back. Amen.